This is a series of talks and discussions on topics to do with the environment, circular economy, sustainability. Um, and today we're joined by Duncan Baker Brown for a talk about all things retrofit, sustainable architecture, and the circular economy. Um, so it'll be a four to five minutes talk about that, and then we'll have some time for a discussion and some questions at the end as well. So yeah, over to you. Okay, thank you very much for that, Ruby. Uh, can I have cameras on, please, so I can see that everyone's awake? No, that was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no snoozing. <laughs> right, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Yeah. Okay, can everyone see? Can you see um, the single image or can you see the, um, what can you see? Yeah. Cool, you see the right thing. Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, my name's Duncan Baker Brown. Um, I'm a principal lecturer at the University of Brighton where I've taught for decades uh, and I've been, always been focused on sustainability and closed loop systems and circ the circular economy. I'm an architect in practice as well and I write books and research and I describe myself as a climate activist as well. Um, and I start, I always start with a similar slide. So if you've seen me speak before, apologies, but some things aren't going away. Like I think, um, I think as society is deciding or the politicians that tell us what to do are deciding we can't afford the cost of sustainability, uh, but we can afford to uh, give the fossil fuel procurers ever more money to keep our energy bills just not as high as they could be. So uh, what, why is this a responsibility of everybody on this call to address the climate and ecological emergency, and especially in the built environment? Well, um, 10 years ago, uh, humans extracted, harvested and mined about between uh, 45 and 60 billion tonnes of material from the planet every year. and uh, Last year, that had gone up to about 135 billion tons of stuff. It's a huge amount of stuff, and I can't you know, imagine it, but you can see there's a quantum leap of stuff. Um, and it's the construction sector consumes 50% of those raw, raw materials every year. And it's the environmental destruction associated with this extraction process that's one of the main factors in generating the current mass extinction of species. In the UK, our, um, our citizens consume or buy 600 million tons of products a year, and we generate 200 million tons of waste. The construction sector is responsible for over 60% of that, that waste flow. So it's 120 to 130 million tons of material going to landfill and mainly incineration every year. And just as a heads up, you know, you'll hear companies declaring that uh, they've got you know zero percent of their waste going to landfills because they're burning all of it. So what watch out for that. But also the construction sector is in effect responsible for nearly half the carbon emissions. So the design of buildings, the construction of them, the occupation of them, the maintenance of them, and then the deconstruction of them or the demolition of them has that sort of huge carbon footprint. So I say that the construction industry is sort of responsible for half of the climate emergency. The other thing I would add is that across Europe, different European countries, the percentage of their waste flows from the construction sector are a lot less, anything from 35 to 45%. So we're particularly high. So my point of view is that humankind needs to learn how to manage planet Earth's resources, and it's designers and constructors who do this. So it's all about managing resources and dramatically reducing the need to consume new raw materials and to think about where materials come from and where they end up. The challenge is, or put simply, we exist as a linear economy at the moment. So we take material, raw materials, we make them into things, and then we use them for moments. And I haven't got the stats here, but nearly two thirds of what we buy this year, we would have thrown away and used up within six months, whatever it is. And that's we as a sort of society of 60 million people. So some good news. Believe it or not, 
if you design a 10 meter by 10 meter concrete slab and you make it 50 millimeters skinnier than normal, you save as much carbon as avoiding meat for the year. The other thing I would say is that everybody's still asking, what is a circular economy? It is the topic in the world of design and architecture. Um, I've been in the world of sustainable design for over 25 years, and we used to do one event a year sort of thing, <laughs> and it's now for a week. You know, So it really is what people are wanting to know properly about. And we now have data. We can now measure things. So beware of people saying that they're doing the most sustainable X, Y, and Z. Measure it. We have the data. The other thing, you know, you've got David Chipperfield, a very well established uh, architect, won the biggest prize in architecture last year with the strap line. Retrofit is not only the right thing to do, it's the more interesting to, thing to do. And I completely agree. Our students are making a noise because they're not being taught the right stuff. They are at my university, obviously. But <laughs> qualify that statement. I was a bit frustrated with Richard. Wait, wait, the AJ, because he didn't interview any students from Brighton when he came up with that headline. But it might not have been so interesting if students said, everything's all right. <laughs> um, we've got people in prison at the moment. And they're, they're, you know, why they're in prison is because they protested about the lack of insulation in our built environment and the problems that that causes. The other thing is that what we've noticed, we as a sort of collection of people in the massive construction sector is that resource security is a thing of the past. We can't guarantee that materials will be on site on time. And coming out of COVID, we couldn't do guaranteed labor either. The other thing is, we, and this is where we get to need to think about where things come from and where they end up. These people here in this image are part of the supply chain that enables the construction of buildings in the UK. So that's an open cast copper mine in Chile. Try building and constructing and designing a building without using co copper. So we need to reuse the previously manufactured. I came up with, when I wrote a book in 2017, I came up with this phrase, mine the Anthropocene. Uh, and it's actually the Anthroposphere, the current geological epoch that we're in. So the Anthroposphere is the human made layer of stuff that wraps planet Earth, whether it's plastic in our oceans, uh, microplastics or pollution in the air or whatever, the seats are sitting on the buildings you're in. So my point of view is rework that stuff. We've manufactured enough, we've processed enough, we've dug up enough stuff. If we stop the digging up, in, you know, in very simplistic terms, we can nurture natural resources. Let them, In some places they'll need a bit of help, in other places, as we saw in the first lockdown with COVID, nature came running back really quickly within weeks. Air quality got really good within weeks. You know, these we are making a huge effort to keep things dangerous. So rework that stuff, close down mines, and um, yeah, mine the anthroposphere. And the, the other good news is we know what to do. Uh, the RIBA next year, the Royal Institute of British Architects, I chair their Climate Action Expert Advisory Group. We've got mandatory climate literacy tests for all our 48,000 members next year. Um, the UK Net Zero Carbon Building Standard was published in its uh, pilot uh, version last week. I sit on the government's board, or did until a couple of weeks ago, for this initiative. Now, this might look dull, but it's for me it's incredibly impactful because it's got to, it's got more groups than those logos show there, but it's got just about every major institution in the construction industry, major client-facing groups, insurers, etc and the people, investors as well. Now, what this is, is a set of rules that the construction industry can apply to enable it to spend its meager carbon budget if we've got net zero targets of 2050 to, to aim for. It's, a, it's the set of rules that we can apply. What we really want this to do is to convince central government that the construction industry has an idea of what how to do low carbon or whole life low carbon. And so what we're hoping the output for that will be what this bill has tried to do on three occasions during the um, previous government, which is to legislate for embodied carbon, the stuff that goes into the making of the built environment, the, that impact. If you legislate and benchmark that, then retrofit becomes the more attractive thing to do. Because at the moment we're in the world with residential retrofit where it attracts VAT at 20%, new build, 
is a zero percent. So we're actively encouraged to demolish at the moment. But I was in, you know, really impressed that this bill was presented three times and almost got voted through with a Conservative government. Uh, hopefully, if, if, when it gets represented and with the net zero carbon building standard behind it. We've got hundreds of cities now with circular economy route maps, the London one, the part of the London plan on the left, the one I was involved with in Brighton on the right. The one I was involved with in Brighton has already enabled um, some uh, projects that apply circular economy of principles in just normal projects. So um, in the, in the, my book, the reuse atlas that's come out in a couple of a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of the case studies there is just a, a social housing scheme in Brighton for 62 units, and instead of pouring concrete, it's uh, it's steel frame and steel stud work bolted together, so one day it can be unbolted, and that was literally because they applied the criteria that's in the circular economy route map for the building to be a material store for the future. When they let that contract or let the tender, sorry, they didn't get people complaining that, oh, we can't do this. They just didn't pour loads of concrete like they normally do. They just remember there's this other way of doing. So it doesn't need to be that big a deal. It's I think it's really important if you can get these principles folded into the contracts that you write, the briefs, I mean, the briefs you write that enable the contracts. And I also think that my personal belief is going to be competing city states and regions that give us hope, not governments preoccupied with new, numerous other big issues before they can think of the environment, climate change question. Uh, with more than 50 percent of the world's population in cities now, that's where stuff flows in and that's where stuff flows out at the moment. So you've got all these linear economies flowing in and out. All we need to do to turn those linear systems into circular ones is to learn from nature where waste from one system is food for another. So you start getting these flows talking to each other and lots of people are looking at that. It's the circular economy route map for London when it was first published in 2017, uh, identified tens of thousands of new jobs with, it, with this opportunity uh, and the wealth associated with that. So we just need to think of our cities as mere material stores for the future. I deliberately show an aerial shot of Brighton there where most of it in the foreground is is listed. I'm not talking about the mass deconstruction of the built environment. I'm talking about a strategic approach uh, to the built environment that in, in, enables an understanding of the building physics and how to transform it. But it's not just building physics, it's about people and place. But to a certain extent, we're all going to become urban miners searching for new material sources to reduce the need for using natural raw materials. And I won't go into this project because that could be a lecture on its own, but this is, I've literally just come from this place this morning. So this is the Brighton Waste House, which is actually a two story teaching facility on campus in Brighton. And it's, it's the, was the world's first passive house performing building made out of 55 tons of material other people threw away. Constructed by over 360 students in only one year, the cheapest project per square meter that the university had ever done and the quickest. And it's uh, 10 years later, it's still going. But it's attracted other research projects, including a five million euro one with um, led by a consultancy in, in Brussels called Rota. And Rota are famous for uh, enabling reuse where other people would de demolish. And what it, the, the project's got a very dull name. It's called the FCRBE project. But if you look it up online, it's an interreg project EU funded. Um, there are over 20 downloadable documents on in effect on what to look out for and how to deconstruct buildings and it's just really amazing stuff and it's and that's what this project's been about and it's been seven years because it was extended by two years because of covid i was responsible for doing the student facing element of that we wish to curate something that we a summer school that we called the school of reconstruction it was meant to be hosted in brighton uh, and we had students from six european countries uh, att uh, attend. There was going to be 80 students, but it was in 2020 and it got put, put on hold. But if it had been face to face, Brighton Hope City Council were prepared to let us borrow a school that they'd mothballed. So that was where we we're going to use the site. And they were also, I, I wrote the brief for this, they were um, prepared to deconstruct a building that they had uh, put aside for demolition. So they weren't going to demol demolish it, they were going to deconstruct it. I sent that out to demolition companies who bit my hand off. They all wanted to prove they could do it. And the idea was that the demolition company or rebranded deconstruction company 
would stack up the building components in the playground of this school and our students and the team leaders and the photographs of the people there are the team leaders they would reappraise this material and that's what they would do at the school of reconstruction then at the end of the school of reconstruction brighton hove wanted to put that material out into the supply chain to see if anybody would go anywhere near it i don't know if they would have done and we unfortunately we didn't do that we did the digital version of the ski of the school the next year in 2021 um, and we were able to spread uh, it further because it was online so we had students from south america and north america europe across to china which was incredible and because it was so amazing we got we wrote a book about it so that was published in july this year so uh, and also because it had eu funding it's open source so you can download that book online for for nothing so that's good news and there's some more good news which is this thing <laughs> um i'm just gonna i was giving the cup of tea so i'm just gonna drink it um yeah, the reuse atlas. Um, when we when we did the the waste house in 2014, it attracted a lot of attention around the world, and I began to realise that I was becoming a bit of a conduit for the world of the circular economy and, and reuse, etc. So I, I wrote the reuse atlas, published it in 2017, and it had about 26 case studies from the built environment, but also from <coughs> fashion, textiles, and product design, and and even the food industries. <clears throat> but um, then I was asked about three years ago to do the second edition, this time to focus on architecture. And it was delayed because the good news is that there's just so many, so much good work going on. And a lot of my case studies are drawn from the Netherlands and uh, Denmark, but more and more in the UK. And this book was delayed because I'd interview someone to talk about their project and they'd say, well, this is quite good, but look at this. Oh, and by the way, I know someone else doing this. So it just sort of mushroomed. And now the new edition, the book is physically twice the size, but it's also got 40 case studies in it. And it's pretty much all the built environment. And that's just a summary there. And what it does, it takes you on a route towards the circular economy, starting with the most basic thing you can do, which is to recycle stuff. Recycling is all right, but it you lose the provenance and history and nature of the material sometimes. Uh, but it also creates pollution and consumes energy. If you can reuse, that is a big step. The third chapter is reduce, which is doing what you normally do, but hardly using any material. Now, how do you do that? And then the last chapter is the circular economy. And you can see that case studies wise, I'm least interested in recycling. and I'm most interested in reuse in the circular economy, really. And that's luckily where we've got lots of case studies. And that's what I'm going to talk about now, some of these case studies. So yeah, I thought a bird was coming in then. <laughs> we almost got a bird coming. Anyway, so step one is recycling. And this is a, a, a nasty linear system that's, ha uh, that's out there at the moment, which is uh, chewing gum and bubble gum. Every country in the world, apparently, people chew gum. Every local authority in the world has the problem of cleaning up chewing gum on the streets. In the UK, Local authorities spend millions of pounds every year cleaning up streets from because of the chewing gum on the floor, on the on the pavement. So this is a company called GumTech that collects chewing gum and turns it into stuff. So it's got its GumTech bin, which is a chewing gum bin made of chewing gum. When that bin's full up, the bit the full bin gets sent back to the GumTech factory to be reprocessed into more bins. But they also do lots of other things like Stan Smith training shoes made of mm. old chewing gum. So it's a nasty thing, but it's one of the things it's turned a, a nasty thing into from a linear system into a circular one. And that's, by the way, by coincidence, a Brighton student who started we, we, with our, one of our product design courses. We get them to play around with different materials and she started playing around with chewing gum and just sort of realizing it's plastic at the end of the day. I'm talking of plastic, smile plastics have been going since the 1990s and um, they were going bust about 10 years ago. And then another one of our Brighton students on the same course bought smile plastics and now is based a factory in Wales. And I don't know if you guys, you probably are aware of the sort of Fab City network. Do you know about the idea of Fab City? So the Fab City is a sort of international network of cities and the Fab City movement is basically focusing on how cities can produce the stuff they need. So 
this smile plastics factory the idea is that you can you can uh, it's be like a franchise where you 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 borrow the model or you pay for the model and you set up your own factory that collects waste plastic from local sources and reprocesses the processes that plastic into stuff and in this case it's reprocessing it into this is a house in london i mean can you imagine that kitchen but that that is old plastic chopping boards which now we're all realizing is a source of microplastics being turned into this so this for me is still flawed because it's a source of microplastics but it's collecting a nasty thing and trying to turn it into a practical thing the question of plastic and what to do with it i'm not answering in this book i mean it's i i personally want to avoid it so with that in mind i'm actually more interested in this company which is called again they're danish and they were set up by um an offshoot of a an architect that does a lot of closed loop circular design and i'll talk about the architects later but they need they didn't have the uh, specification of materials that they needed for their projects. They were realizing they were slowing their projects down to try and invent this stuff. Again, is about going to the normal architectural supply chain and turning the, the spe those things from linear things into circular things. So developing a, a circular economy uh, supply chain for the industry. What I'm going to talk about here briefly is um one last recycling project which start this is one of my own and we started by we were commissioned by Glymore Opera House to do a new building for them on site and this is a resource map that we use which is where we focused on what materials we can get on site and that, and not just materials but hu human systems as well and networks and then we look at what's five mile five miles away 10 uh, 15 miles away and there's all sorts of things here but Glymborn obviously has hundreds of people arrived to see this opera and they have waste streams like corks oyster and lobster shells unfortunately but they do um and then uh, chalk and other stuff but you can see that the unfired bricks and the overfired bricks were from a brickyard within five yards away five miles away but what was interesting and but a bit sad at the time was they had ash dieback and that's gone through the uk it's gone across europe and um they had chopped, this is a photograph of Glyndebourne's ash trees being chopped down. And you can see how big they are. So most ash, when it's chopped down, goes straight to um, an incinerator in Kent. So it gets chipped and burnt. So that carbon that's locked becomes unlocked. Um, but in this case, the, t the timber was usable. So we got it sawn and it's beautiful timber. And then the idea was that with the pavilion that we designed for Glyndebourne was going to be made out of uh, the glue laminated timber frame made from ash dieback on site. And then the, the wall in this image at the back wall there, that we, we worked with a London company called Biome who are developing mycelium technologies. So that's mycelium being mushrooms. So we were going to use mycelium insulation, but also this sort of uh, this material on the back there, which was uh, food waste and garden waste mixed with a mycelium type of mixture and that was going to be the, the the internal finish of the building so that was great but unfortunately that project got shelved after lockdown uh, just because they don't have the visitor numbers that they had before but then we had this one which was only five miles away from Glyndebourne so this is a house on top of the South Downs that burnt down unfortunately and what it was a massive house it was eight bedrooms and it was a bungalow so it had the weirdest plan it had really deep plan like one room after another without windows it was just very strange it burnt down and so our um our client wanted us to design a new house on that site which we did but what we didn't do is take the material off site we used the material so the south downs national park wouldn't let us to thank thank the lord they wouldn't let us there's a uh, build another bungalow on the site. They wanted a house that was less impactful. Um, and this is a this is a photograph from the site. It's obviously a lot of chalk. It's a south facing steep slope. And the South Downs National Park wanted us to partially dig the house into into the chalk so you couldn't see so much of it. So it ended up looking like a couple of barns and a lot of it was subterranean, but it meant there was a lot of chalk. And we're right next to the South Downs National Park, uh, sorry, South Downs Way, the route. 
So we had a lot of people thinking we'd set up a quarry. It was quite <laughs> the other thing that the, the South Downs Park wanted us to do was to chop down the 80 non in, uh, non indigenous trees on site. So the first thing people saw was a load of trees being felled, and then it, 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 we got a lot of complaints. <laughs> but you can see we got a lot of material, and we were really worried we'd have too much. But the chalk was re was reused. I'll show you that in a minute. And this was the sort of concrete blocks and concrete that was ground up, and we made the window sills on site. So um, with with some chalk as well and some line. So. This image is a detail of a windowsill. So the window is obviously, that comes from Denmark. The bricks come from four miles away, a place called Chaley. And it's lime mortar. So lime mortar falls away from the brickwork. So you can use lime mortar as long as the bricks are in compression. And the great thing is that that embodied carbon in that brick, you can you invest in it, but you can use those bricks for hundreds of years because you can reuse them again and again. Whereas if you have cement based mortar, you can't reuse them. That windowsill was made on site from lot work and bricks that were not usable. Then some of the burnt bricks we used in the floors. So that's a sample on the left there. So we, we, we were able to polish them. So you'll see in a minute, I think I've got the photos. But those images on the right are different plaster samples because we were able to mix chalk with clay from the bottom of the hill to make these plasters. And then this is some of the what, what happened with the um, ash dieback. So that's a, tr a truss. And there are also beams that we used. And this is the beginning of the house. By the way, it's a big house. So, <laughs> so what, but what this is, it, this is the timber you can see is, in this case, this is sweet chestnut that comes from local coppice woodlands. Sweet chestnut is one of the only examples I know of of a sort of genuinely regenerative thing to apply to your building. So it's London is surrounded by sweet chestnut and hornbeam. Uh, the Romans planted it initially, and then we sort of later on in the Middle Ages, we were making charcoal out of it to, uh, in the Iron Age, etc. Right up to the 1980s, and then that industry has fallen away. We've got a lot of coppice in. The amazing thing is that I work with people who did research with the BRE, the Building Research Establishment, that proves that quick grain sweet chestnut, which is only 25 years old, was more durable than oak. So if you that means leave the oak trees alone, let them support 3,000 species or whatever, and rework those working woodlands that the Romans gave us. What's incredible about doing that is that coppicing means that the root system lives. So you just cut the trees down to about 300 mil above the ground, and then you get eight to ten stems coming out of one root system 25 years later you cut them down again but all the time it is a carbon sink whereas if you do clear felling of trees you then have to wait 50 to 75 years before you get the carbon sink also the trees grow really quickly because they've got 300 year old root system but the most amazing thing is if you use that timber which by the way doesn't need any treating treatment is you just put it up raw as it were you create a greater level of biodiversity than if you leave those woodlands alone so you can say by specifying that timber, I'm increasing the amount of biodiversity in that place where I got the timber from, which is uh, really exciting. And what's happening there with all those bags, by the way, that's just topsoil. This is, and it's relevant to retrofit, even though this project's new build. Uh, I've done quite a lot of research into a Swiss version of a living roof, which is a lightweight meadow roof. And it was invented accidentally by accident by a chicken farmer in in Switzerland, who built his big chicken uh, shed with a monopitch roof, crinkly tin roof, and the planners came and pointed out to him he hadn't got planning approval. So they said either hide it or tear it down. So he thought, what can I, what can I do? So he mowed his meadows and put the grass on top of the crinkly tin and then put a bit of top, a topsoil on there to keep the grass from blowing away. Not too much though, because he'd only got a crink, crinkly tin roof. The seeds in the grass germinated and with you know two or three years later he's got a growing roof but without the heavy substrate underneath it now why that's so clever is that if i just click to the next image which is the the house in on its setting it is huge anyway <laughs> <laughs> anyway but what it is is the grass you can see around the house on the downs we've hardly got any topsoil so what you get is is the, is the downland grasses and flowers 
growing on the roof and nothing else because there's no substance there aren't the nutrients for it to grow so you end up with what can be there so the, these are photographs of the building recently so and this is the meadow in the front which is germinating but and wherever it's brick it's got the, the growing roof on top anyway so that this is more of the ash dieback all the timber there on the in the ceiling is ash dieback so that was actually cheaper than normal because our clients had bought it for Glyndebourne. They didn't need it. They sold it. But it's, it's about getting resources when you can. And that you can be saving money because you know, it's an unstable environment. So here you sort of get the language of the old bricks on the floor, the new bricks on the wall and the ash. And this is, an, this is a staircase made of ash like dieback. So I'm showing you a waste material, something that normally gets thrown away. OK, back to the real world. <laughs> <laughs> My wife says, you design these houses for other people. Why can't we have one? <laughs> I'm not a multimillionaire. Anyway, I mentioned Rota. Rota are pioneers. They, they were artists, curators and interior architects and that, that now what they do is they focus on deconstructing buildings that people normally demolish and these slides are to be read from top left to bottom right they are unpacking this building they've been part this is a lovely book that's just been published which is called how not to demolish a building it's about the world trade center in brussels which was up for demolition and it's been retrofitted and adapted but the materials that are coming off it where they are taking bits of it down etc are being redistributed by rota and other people so they have the physical and digital infrastructure to redistribute stuff into the supply chain. This is Superuse, who are also pioneers. They're based in Rotterdam. And this is a building on an air airport, which you'd think would just be pushed over. This is, a, this is a source of material for them, which is horrible old UPVZ windows coming off a housing estate in Rotterdam. They found a company that were willing to clean up those windows. And they did up that building on the in the in the airport. Now, the reason I'm using that is because I showed you lots of beautiful stuff with that big posh house. And that stuff, by the way, isn't expensive. You can apply that to anything. But it just happens to be the example I've got here. I thought when you get into the world of reuse, sometimes it's not the pretty material you really want to be working. So the challenge is how to make you PVC windows because it's what well, you know, how to use them, where to use them. This is also super use, and this is, I love this project. This is a school building, and it's a storyboard describing how the old building became the new building on the same site. So you've got a decrepit old building, top left, you measure it, take it apart, you, you, do, you turn it into a game with the kids, and of course they don't reassemble it the same as it was uh, originally. So here it is for real, being deconstructed. Here's one of the models of the building where they've got the elements in as a kit of parts and I, I love this this is like a, a a toy but then they start reassembling the bits in a different way and this is how the building ended up for real so and this is a, a thought-provoking thing in Maastricht they've got a problem where they've got uh they this the brief was that the urban situation needed to be suburbanized because they've got a lack of population Population's getting smaller. The first couple of slab blocks they just demolished. They then thought, right, now stop, let's give this some thought. Let's do it a different way. So the next one, they cut up with an angle grinder. In effect, in the block of flats was cut up into the individual flats. And they reassembled them and made a pavilion saying, this is the staff. So that stopped the project. That was like a polemic that went, stop. And then the next one, and you know, you know what, I've just come in by train, and when you come to London Bridge, just before it, there's that amazing, near Millwall Football Ground, there's that amazing multi-storey former res residential housing block, which is just a concrete frame now. Mm. And it's, you know, they've stripped everything out, so it's just the frame, and I hope, I, I heard it was going to be demolished, I hope they retrofit it, because that's what they've done here. So there's the old frame retrofitted, and what they did is they turned some of the flats into maisonettes, they even had... The ground floor is a row of terrace houses. So it's a different typology for the situation. And you can see the little original pavilion 
that stop those being demolished. This is an interesting project. This is the um, University of Cambridge Entopia building, which is um, was an old um, uh, sort of te uh, telephone exchange. So humans didn't go into it. It looks nice, but that's because it's in in Cambridge. But it was that's how it used to be. Well, you know, it might not look like that if it come where I come from. But anyway, so it's the Cambridge Institute of Sustainable Leadership now. So they actually had to the architects that got involved with it. Um, sorry, had to spend a lot of time working out how to get light into the building. So that's why the windows were changed. They insulated it with natural materials, which is nice. Sort of. Uh, um, t timber fiber and uh, cork and uh, organic materials like uh, lime plasters and things, which is great. And that's it finished. So all, all nice. You know, they had secondhand steel on the roof to to uh, support the um, PV system. But what I was most interested in, whoops, is the lighting and the fittings and the desks and stuff. This came from a Cat A fit out. And I don't know if you guys know what a Cat A or Cat B fit out is, but it's the temporary fit out that you will put in a, tower, a new tower block or a refurbished tower block in the city of London to get the punters in. And as soon as they come in, your of course, your fit out isn't their brand. So they tear it out. And that, I believe, is one of the reasons why the UK's construction sector is so wasteful, because those massive towers if you think they're built, when they're built brand new, they're built and three months later after they're, uh, uh, they're opened and handed over, those interiors have been torn out. Then every five to seven years they're torn out and then after 20 years they're demolished. So that's why. Now this was really interesting because they'd prove that that stuff that is normally thrown away can be reused and that's why that's in the, ba in the case study. In addition, you've got a company called Cleveland Steel, who are really pioneers for the circular economy because for 40 years they have been reusing secondhand steel and they give a warranty on second secondhand steel. So they are, uh, and that's the big deal warranty. But this is a this was an example. This is a, a bit of a, a BIM drawing of a, a light industrial but a big one that was assembled and standing in, in, um, in Dublin. And Cleveland Steel needed a new building, a new, and they've got a hundred acre site in Yorkshire, and they needed a new building for their uh, secondhand steel industry. And instead of buying a new one, they found this one in Dublin. They deconstructed it, reassembled it, and even though the BIM model wasn't quite right, and they had there was quite a lot of faffing around, they saved a million pound on a five million pound project by deconstructing a building and reassembling the building. So. They used it. They spent their money in a different way. Spent their time in a different way, but they spent twenty percent less money. And this is their site. So this is the stuff they normally redistribute, really which is excess material from oil pipelines. And they're one of the three companies in Europe that do this. They've got a hundred acre site full of this stuff. This stuff ends up in Liverpool's football stadium, the West Ham one, um, Spurs' new stadium. Whenever you see tubular structure. It's secondhand oil pipe. But what's interesting is this is a recent shot from their factory. They are finding secondhand building frames and redistributing those. This is the Lendiger Group who set up the company called Again that I mentioned before. And it's not actually pronounced Lendiger, it's Leniger. Not yet, none of the <laughs> vowels are pronounced. <laughs> anyway. So this is a new school made out of the old school. So the old school is the image on the left and the image on the middle and the right of the new school. And I'm, what's been good about the new edition of my book, because it's bigger, I can publish drawings. So this is the architects explaining how to put together a new building and design a new building out of the old building, which is the new building is a totally different shape to the old one. But they had these lovely timber trusses, but they were so skinny, they couldn't take the loadings of new roofs that have to have insulation and maybe solar panels on the roof. So this is showing that uh, this is the structural engineer showing the new addition of bits of steel. This is the buildings being disassembled. So there are all sorts of different vintages. The big one on the sort of middle to the left is from the 19th century, but the rest are from the 70s. And this is the sort of palette of materials coming off the buildings. And this is them being stored temporarily. This is the trusses and this is the new school made out of the old school. I've got one more minute.
We've got until 3.30. So Have we? I've got yes, loads more to say. Can I just see everyone turn their cameras on, please? Well, can, I hear, <laughs> can I hear snoring? <laughs> this is cool. I mean, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, you know, those roofs are obviously randomly shaped and that's just the, the architect's sort of whimsical thing. But <laughs> the point is, it's the old school made making the new school. So the, where we are, by the way, we is in the UK is we're at the point where most local authorities are asking, what are the digital tools and physical infrastructure we need to facilitate this? Because moving forward, it's local authorities who have the buying power and commitment to place communities, et cetera, who are going to, I think, are going to be facilitating the circular economy in the most impactful way initially. That and the City of London, who's already, I know, of projects, by the way, who's had a bunch of structural engineers come and see me at the Waste House yesterday. Yeah, it's always off the record, but there's a great big tower block in Piccadilly that's been deconstructed rather than demolished, and it's going to be re built somewhere else and all this sort of stuff great well, let's see it so you know people with money are are understanding it's it's a way of making money but how do we measure it and this is this is a lovely map it's a bit blurry but this is a 3d resource map of the greater Mel metropolitan district of amsterdam and it's actually put together by a consultancy called metabolic and they measure the flows of stuff in and out of cities whether that's energy people clothes water food and in this case it's the sort of material dna of the built environment and it tells you how much you've got and what it is now if you know that you can then have an estimate of what what your resource resources are again if you're a local authority owns buildings You've got that, you, you get that date, data, and then you can start planning and being strategic. So, for example, I know Metabolic are working in, I know they're working in London, actually, but they're also working in uh, Rotterdam, where with the local authority there, with the city, they've got a 10-year plan for development. So they're looking at places, that are, uh, sites that are going to be built on with housing, etc., and they're looking at sites that are currently up for demolition and probably would be demolished over the next decade. And what they're doing is turning those demolition sites into deconstruction sites. They're measuring what they've got as a resource and then thinking, how does that affect the design? If we use that material, the old material on the new site. So they're thinking strategically. This is pioneering work by Dr. Elma Demizovic, who I work with quite a lot. And she's, this is a, um, a sort of, a, um, Big, uh, a bolt on for a Revit models. And what you're describing is a deep survey of one hospital building or bit of a hospital building in Amsterdam and it's color coded. So it's not only the type of component that you're looking at, whether it's a bit of structure or internal lining, external lining windows, but also the quality of the artifact. So you're seeing if something's reusable, recyclable or properly going to be waste. So you can think of the flows off. This building, which is a big hospital complex, they've done, they've measured the whole thing. They know what the steel frame is, and the steel frame is currently for sale. If it gets bought, it will be disassembled. If it doesn't, it will be pushed over and recycled. So that's what's, that's the thing. If you measure what you've got, you can then put it out there and see if there's a market. And increasingly there is. And this is interesting because is this, this is Lagermat, who are a demolition company doing the same. So they're, they're a company that kept coming up when I was interviewing different architects and clients for my book. They kept saying, well, we're working with Lagomat, who are produ who's supplying us with concrete panels. Or who are Lagomat? I interviewed them and they, they showed me they're doing the similar sort of drawings that are defining what that ugly building is. You know, what it's a pile of these sorts of windows and these sorts of staircases. Can we how can we re reuse it? And they're not the only people doing it. This is a network of demolition companies rebranding themselves as deconstruction companies. And we've got stuff going on in this country as well. So this is born out of different research projects. And this is the material reuse portal, which is an embryonic new thing. And the reason I was interested in it is because who's involved with it? eBay. So it's going to be, well, it's very quickly, once it becomes, you can see a viable business plan, it's going to be Amazon, eBay who are going to help us procure this. But you know, do you all know re-London? Yeah, so you can see that. Step three, retrofit. 
So I've done a lot of retrofit in my time. And, you know, from a creative point of view, it can be a bit dull. Uh, but this was amazing. This was a project we got involved with ten, about 10 years ago with Innovate UK. So it was, a, it was a research project. There were 83 social housing ex case studies um, that where they, each project was given £150,000. So we had a six room, a six studio, uh, sorry, we had this freestanding Victorian house in Brighton, which had six studio apartments in it. And with our 150,000, we got the operational carbon figure reduced by 80%. What was interested in is an end of terrace house in Dagnum had the same budget, which was like, <laughs> at the time, the same value as the house. So they didn't, they didn't do anything different with the budget. It's just like, what happened? And then we measured, you know, the idea was to measure if they were successful or not. So this one was quite complex because it had six different end users. It ended up only having one gas-fired boiler and one solar thermal solar panel on the roof and its cut operational carbon was reduced by 80 percent it had mechanical ventilation heat recovery the front elevation was listed so we had internal insulation the side elevations and rear elevation weren't interest in listed so we had 150 mil of insulation bolted on the outside and rendered so this became a, a highly insulated building so that's all right if you've got a bit of money and also if it's larger it becomes um viable then we did for um a collection of seven local authorities we did the circular economy route map which we started in 2022 and the idea was these it was the brighton Ho and hove economic partnership which is crawley down to brighton and local authorities east and west of that sort of line and um between them, they've got 55,000 social homes. And what was incredible is the guy that initiated this, he'd worked for the seven local authorities in housing and knew there was only eight house types across those <laughs> local authorities. If you call 19th century housing one house type, which is not anything solid wall was like one house, um, but then seven others. So we were looking at, oh, sorry, just, just before I said that, they had a collective budget, their, their sort of maintenance budget for those 55,000 homes of a billion pounds for the next 10 years. The ambition was to re-spend that money in a different way to and get all the housing stock up to the EPCC. So the first thing we did is take the eight case studies and do a deep dive study into them, which included running eight parallel models from SAP, EPC, uh, and, other, and then more sophisticated thermodynamic modeling on those eight different house types or dwelling types to see I and mean, then by the way everyone's got high level data on their social housing now haven't they in terms of its epc-ness so we would test to see how accurate or not that apc was we were interviewing tenants we did the whole lot and they, 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 we were measuring um energy use on site very so it was a big study we were able to compare these things and then we were like able to, with that data able to sort of do impactful interventions um, on the project. So what you're seeing on the right there, where it's sort of orangey, this is where we're doing different um, levels of retrofit. So the most basic one, which is just literally loft insulation, if you've got a loft, new windows, new doors, that's the beginning and end of it. Then there's other levels, external wall insulation or not. With cavity construction, wall construction, uh, one of the things we did, by the way, which was to overclad the external brick leaf with um clay tiles to make that external leaf dry because what local authorities are finding is if they're blowing the cavities with new insulation in those cavities about 10 percent of them are failing and it's because that external skin is super saturated all the time when it's raining so if you make that dry you get a better u value if you want to improve it even more you put stuff in the cavity but we were looking at um right what the current epc was and then letty the uh Low Energy Transformation Initiative, or they used to be called the London Energy Transformation Initiative. They bought out a guide to retrofit, which and they had their best practice and their exemplar levels. So we were looking at what got you to EPCC and then what got you up to what Letty was saying we should be doing. And that was great. But by the time we'd finished the study, there was the cost of living crisis. Rents were capped. They didn't have the money. So we're left with, oh, we know what to do. 
But the, the idea was that seven local authorities getting together could go to government and say, right, we can get it to EPCC, which is what you want us to do. Give us this money and we'll do these other things and we'll be off grid almost. But this is where we've got to be creative because there isn't the budget to do it, to wrap the whole built environment in, in external wall insulation. And so this is why I say, remember, retrofit has to be more than external wall um, insulation and solar panels. And so we need a creative approach to retrofit and adaptive reuse. And I think it's a huge opportunity for the design industry. I think architects and designers have got to step up and understand buildings from different uh, vintages, different generations, how they're occupied. I'm talking about the whole built environment now, and then respond to that to look at how to make them climate resilient, healthy places to be and wrapping them with insulation might not be the solution. So, for example, we've done work with the London Borough of Newham. We as a practice, um, different building typologies, totally different building typologies there, where the idea was to create a uh, retrofit these buildings, but also some of these buildings, are, well, I think all of them actually are sort of a gateway to sort of green jobs as well. So it's it's an exemplar project that then raises awareness of that things can be done. It's not always using loads of insulation and especially with heritage buildings, by the way, insulation is not always the great that need required so much in their in their walls. There was a this, there's an organization called SPAB, which is the Society for the Preservation of Ancient Buildings. And they did this really interesting study 20 years ago, I think, that basically said all those Georgian and Victorian terrace houses in London and everywhere else that in the 1950s through to 70s had their shutters torn out, their awnings taken off, and they were sort of stripped back to look minimal. If you put those things back, back in, reinstalled them, they would do a lot more than a low energy boiler and double glazing. So it's like curtains on the inside, plus shutters on the inside, awnings on the outside so you don't overheat, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which is quite right. So it's really re just understand how these buildings were designed in the first place. What I'm going to show now is some examples of creative retrofit, which doesn't necessarily involve conventional insulation. So this is a building by Jacob and McFarland. This is not by them, actually. This is the 1913 concrete frame framed warehouse next to the Seine. And um, Yakima and McFarlane, Paris-based architects, were given the gig to transform that build, that warehouse into a fashion school. And so they applied a new layer of stuff. Now, I always preface this image with saying it's not to my taste, but what I like about it is that it explains what's going on. You've got the historic layer, which is all about locking that carbon and doing doing the heavy work of supporting it's the, it's the load bearing structure it's the thermal mass etc the new layer is lightweight it's giving you a roof garden it's giving you solar panels it's dealing with light etc and circulation now please don't take this too literally but what i'm interested in is the space between the existing and the new the new program the new accommodation and how that can transform the existing into a low carbon healthy place to be so it's a space that might have been occupied by insulation, but you just sort of pull these layers apart and start occupying the spaces between the layers. So you hardly do anything to the existing building, you, apart from adding on to it. And here's a, another example, which is my favorite. Lacazette and Versailles, based in Paris again, um, uh, went to the mayor of Paris and said, that building on the left, that um, 22 storey residential block, we know you want to demolish it. And we know you put the money aside to build a new residential block, just the same. We have got a scheme, if you employ us, that will save you 30% of your funding. And there it is on the, on the right there. And what they did is they didn't demolish the block, they just took the facade off. And then they replaced it with a winter garden and that's what this is. Can you see that? Yeah, you can. So, and this happened in the same, in one day. So the other thing, and the great thing, it's stating the obvious, but I'm not sure it's said that loud, the big benefit of retrofit is you don't destroy the community. Yeah, you work with it and develop their place together rather than clear filling the building and saying to the community, oh yeah, you can come back in five years. It's not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So you're not having to redistribute the community. Here, 
they didn't leave the building. This is sheltered housing for older people. And they just took the nasty facade off, told them to go out for the day. <laughs> facade came off, on they clipped this winter garden, which is a layer of sli full height sliding double glazed windows with blinds on, on the inside to prevent glare in the winter. Then a two meter space, then another layer of the same with, uh, crucially with a balcony which shades you from summer sun. So here they are being bolted on on the left hand side there. And that's before and after. Now they didn't spend a penny on decorating tenants flats. So I should use the, uh, some of the other images that like, you know, sort of you can see old decorations and then suddenly you've got natural light that you're in control of because you've got internal blinds, external stuff. You've got ventilation. You've got an unheated space, but you've got an extra 10 square meters. <laughs> and you've got much reduced energy bills. That's all within the budget as well. That's it? for two thirds of the budget. So that's just win, win, win. Yeah. There is a big book about this project, which was, uh, I think it was a, a self-published thing because it's more like a magazine. Client, the, the tenants whinging about noise and stuff because they're there on site. So, you know, it's not all brilliant, but they've, sorry, look at what they've got. Look at what they had. So we're looking at doing similar things in Brighton. So the gray stuff is three, six story towers. The blue stuff is the Lacatan of a new layer on the existing stuff. The red is the new accommodation above because these towers we, with our structural en engineers we calculated are only working at 42% capacity in terms of structure. So we're putting new modular apartments on, on top. Now the red stuff is super insulated and super high performing. So overall, it does a job for the site to reduce the carbon footprint. So we're doubling the density and halving the carbon footprint. The yellow stuff, the mustard stuff, is actually re-establishing the Victorian building line with courtyard housing at the base next to the road. And I use this really as a way of sort of explaining to students how you might explain the process, the, the sort of step-by-step -step process of turning a high, badly performing in terms of energy and habitable space place into something that's low energy and a nice place to be. That's sort of before and after. This is um, a smaller version of a, a different approach, but again, it's it's adding some new uh, fabric, built fabric. So this is Joe Tello from um, Belgium. And he was asked to transform a, a little farmyard, which was a visitor attraction for kids. So this farmyard in this lovely landscape, which was a productive landscape, all sorts of fruit and vegetables were grown there. And kids went there, schools went there to see how a landscape from the 19th century produced mixed vegetable and fruit. But it had no sheltered space for the kids. So if the weather was bad, it was not good. So he, this is a model. So he literally wrapped the farmyard in a new layer. Now, <laughs> it's single story. The, the slope roof, the big slope roofs have got solar panels on. They're the south facing so, solar panel uh, roofs. But these things open. This is the north sort of north lights that open. Now it's only single glazing, and that's deliberate because obviously it's a greenhouse. It's going to get hot, is it not? Not if it's ventilated. If it's double glazed, it will get hot. So the idea is you just create a buffer zone. It's the it's cheap. It's the first layer. It is a bit like the um, Lacaton of Assault's, um bolt on uh, winter gardens. You create a sheltered buffer zone. So if it's rainy like it is all the time at the moment here and windy, once you get past that single glazing, you are dry, a bit warmer, and it's not windy. So you can do stuff, but you might keep your coat on. Now, we're in an environment which is properly heated. Let's pretend it's insulated as well. <laughs> and that's why I'm in a T-shirt. But the point is you spend your money where you need to, but you can, what the, play, the spaces between the buildings are now part of the program. They're occupied. And it's understanding how people occupy space and buildings. So there you've got uh, the original bakery, little, little building there. That is insulated because they go in there and they use it as a meeting room. But the other spaces are not insulated because you, you're moving around. There's, there could have been more to that, but that's the principle. So don't only put your insulation where you're sedentary. 
So it might be an apartment where you're going to be stationary watching television or working or whatever. Now, this is, I wanted to raise, I, do you know of um, an organisation called RAFT? They're consultants, actually, not an organisation. So it, it, RAFT stands for Re Retrofit Action for Tomorrow. But I think it should stand for Retrofit Action for Today. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is a friend of mine, actually, but this is a case study in my book. So Harry Paticus, there he is. He goes into schools, primary schools as well as secondary schools, and makes retrofit fun. And how he does it is he gets, one of the things he does, he, get, he has this baked potato test. So they bake a potato, and then the competition is who can keep their baked potato hot for the longest. And if you see what they're doing is they're measuring temperature, they're using insulation, they use different types of insulation, and they've got, they take the, the thermo images. And that's a class taking a thermo image of itself, understanding where heat comes from. <laughs> so they understand about heat loss. They understand about all the boring things. And he makes them interesting. And then, you know, he's canny. Then he gets the gig to retrofit the school. But in a really informed way. So he gets the parents on board, the governors on board, the janitors on board, everyone. They understand why they're doing it. And then they have a, a plan for the school. And then when they install an air source heat pump, in this case, it's a big event. Everyone's quite excited about it because they understand the benefit of it. Mm -hmm. But they also know how to target a building. So you're not doing it everywhere. You're doing it where it counts. So that's the sort of community side of it all. But what's interesting is that this is British land. So this is number one Triton Square. So this is obviously big commercial landowners, building owners, only in for it for, for making the money. This is a building that was 19 years old, up for demolition. They decided to retrofit and extend it instead, which is great because they didn't demolish it. What they did though, which is particularly interesting, is the nine story curtain wall system, glazed external glazing system, they didn't destroy. They carefully dismantled it, took it to a car park in Watford, cleaned it up, upgraded it, and put it back with a warranty. So that's why it's in the book, because that's an example of a secondhand thing being upgraded and getting the warranty. And the reason they could do that is because they just went back to the original supplier and said, we bought your external glazing system 19 years ago. Would you do what I just described? And they said, yeah, of course. So it's about engaging with the supply chain. And in this case, you know, it, that building wasn't at the end of its life after 19 years, but it's what happens there is obviously if you've got all the money in the world to spend, you want the latest buildings to show off how wealthy and clever you are. So it was interesting that British Land with Lend Lease did that then. And um, it's a sort of project which will make other people like that get on board. And of course, it's a huge amount of resources that are saved. And that's what the list of things on the right there is all the. 33 and a half thousand tons of concrete kept in situ, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we're now on, remember, we're on these steps. This is the last step. This is the circular economy. So I love this slide because this was from 20, the year 2000, Peter Zumter's Swiss Soundbox, which was a, a big pavilion in Hanover. And that's just the entrance of it. And pavilions at expos are always short term buildings, only last for six months sometimes the best of them get bought and end up in a rich person's garden often they're just thrown away this one was designed to be a material bank for the future so at the end of its life the springs that are compressing those timber timber boards together were released and then you realize you've just got a stack of timber so people came and it was distributed amongst hundreds of buildings this is uh, in london in austman road so War Thistleton are an interesting practice because they were nightclub architects that then had a revelation and said, no, we're not going to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, um, Andrew War said to me, he had his black urinal moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, what's that? He said, it's two o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. I was looking online to specify a black urinal for a client for a nightclub. And I thought, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> so they decided to focus on timber and in particular mass timber timber that's structural timber multi-story buildings and that's what they do obviously we've got an issue with timber in london now which 
you know, there's an ongoing discussion. So they're not doing too many residential projects in London, but they did the first multi-storey building in London, like residential tower block, which was CLT. And CLT performs amazingly in fire. It's, 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 it's an amazing material. In this case, though, what they did is they used CLT and they used steel as well, and it's all bolted together. They used steel because they needed to use the holes in these steel beams to put services through. And they had restricted floor to floor heights. But basically, it's a kit of parts. And what was interesting is that halfway through the project, they had a new client. They had a change of client who demanded that they had an extra staircase. And because they'd used the timber CLT floor decking, they were able to cut out the new stairwell. And the bit of CLT that they cut out to form the stairwell formed the stairs. Mm -hmm. So that's just showing you the how useful timber is. If it had been poured in concrete like it mainly is, you would have been in a different world. So it's a really adaptive building. It's an example of a building that's completely bolted together. It's not their prettiest building, but those panels are just secret fixed and just can come out. This building can be deconstructed and reassembled. This building is a temporary court building in Amsterdam by a practice called CPZ. And they won a competition to design a temporary courthouse uh, in Amsterdam while the main 19th century courthouse got renovated. And they were asked in the competition brief to speculate what how the building would be reused in seven years time. And Menno, who, who was the uh, director in charge, he said, we, we stuck our neck out and we said, you can't predict anything nowadays. We're not going to tell you, what you what's going to happen with the building in seven years time. What we are going to do is give you a building that's a kit of parts and it can be disassembled and reassembled in different ways, in different places. So that is the ultimate flexibility. So what I was interested in was how do you describe to a building contractor a building that's got to be disassembled one day? And these are the sorts of build drawings you do. So that's the structural frame, the external cladding and the internal fit out. And then you've got details of how to bolt things together instead of sticking them together. And then I said to Menno, can you send me, because he said the building's been deconstructed. And I said, great, send me photos of that. So he did. And I was like, how do you know it's that could be the assembly drawing building? You know, how do I know it's not, not assembly instead of de deconstruction? And he said, well, look closer. And actually, if you can see on your screens, there's the expanded foam stuff that even in this building, which was designed as a kit of parts, the building contractors sprayed that in to seal the gap so they got better air tightness. Obviously, you wouldn't have that on a steel frame unless it's been disassembled. And here it is, the, the building stacked in a car park waiting to be reassembled. And it's being reassembled at the moment. And then they show me another building of theirs, which was... This other thing, if you're thinking about the circular economy, it's limiting the palette of materials to make it really straightforward. And this building is really straightforward and it went up very quickly. And they say only three people needed to be uh, on site to make this prefabricated building, which is an office building. So it seemed to be two people working and one person taking a photograph. I think. <laughs> but then they, you know, even the floor system was demountable. Insulation, soundproofing. And that's the building. Now, I would say I'm instantly thinking that's going to overheat or free, you know, the, where, what's the, so this is about the single issue of deconstruction re, and, and disassembly. So that it raises other questions, but this is a, another one of their buildings. So the building on the left from the 1970s became the building on the right from 2024. So it's the material, they were able to deconstruct that building on the left and reuse it. So, I mean, this is the home straight now. So this is an infographic that I've, my practice and I've come up with, which is our strategy for developing new buildings. So the orange exploded uh, diagram in the middle is the project, whatever it is. The gray stuff at the bottom is the existing built environment, the anthroposphere that we are mining, whether it's for whole buildings or bits of buildings. So that's it, you're deconstructing and reprocessing and getting warranties on that stuff and that supplies the site you're looking on site for stuff there first of all then you're mining the anthroposphere and then you're harvesting a regenerative biosphere and then when you can't do anything else you're going to juice things like you normally do <laughs> <laughs> so just have a bit more tea hang on 
to summarize what we're trying to do is make our new building from our old building and the you know the, yeah this is because we're trying to nurture communities nurture the planet dramatically reduce consumption of stuff which we measure as carbon and save money and uh, this is a, a circular economy primer we give to clients which shows the first image on the top left is the existing situation and the last image on the bottom right is the new tweet situation and the processes in between are what we we do as a design team but this is the existing damaged building or building at the end of its life that you would normally demolish and we're saying no measure it see what's really there see how you can reuse what's there and then start importing the anthroposphere and anthroposphere so it's materials and stuff from other building sites perhaps one thing we do with our research, re resource map is we map other people's planning approve, approval sites and look at what those buildings are because there will be material flows off those building sites. So we can start speculating on what will be nearby. Other sources nearby are fact, you know, stuff from factories. Um, and by the way, one day soon, we think when there are remanufacturers, when local authorities are helping us in a way that that will be the source as well, that would be the local source. And then you've got the biosphere, you've got digital communities and networks, you've got your remanufacturing, at the moment, we need education and academic partners because there's a research and a lot of R&D. But obviously, we need communities and that's meant to be government. So you, if you've got all of that in place, you can transform your old building into your new building by using your old building. And that's where I end. There you go. Just in case you pick up my name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. That was such an interesting presentation. <laughs> that was so cool. Also really relevant, I think. There's a lot of yeah. claps on screen, I can see. All right, I missed that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's really relevant to our work, I think, it's for, yeah. for everyone. Yeah. It's, um, we're doing like a statewide retrofit. Um, I'm not sure how much you know about it, but yeah, really similar and very relevant. No. Work. So the Lancaster West Estate is, yeah, undergoing um, like energy efficient retrofit alongside a district heat network oh wow as cool. a heat pump so yeah. that's kind of construction started now um, for that yeah definitely a lot of really interesting work good for us. so you should have been in my book definitely yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna get passed around the team <laughs> um, yeah i'll open up if anyone online has any questions Hi, Danke. That was Hello. certainly informative. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm just thinking about how we're going to reuse our, or what the materials are going to come out of our upcoming refurbishment. And um, would be good to chat with you at some point about your supply chain and where we could potentially reuse these materials. Yeah, it's uh, also the, the it's also the process is. I mean, we're we're doing work for clients where we're going like hopefully with enough notice ahead of the, the construction time to sort of assess the potential for reuse on the site. So you can you can survey the different components of a building, but then it's like what initiatives nearby or in the region can facilitate this. And um, yeah, we've done pro we've, we're working on projects with Welsh schools at the moment because the government Welsh government is really behind the circular economy. So they're making it happen. But again, when you we're talking to Bangor local authority and they they've got the buildings that can store stuff. So because they've got more than one building. So it's understanding what resources you have as a local authority and then what how central government can enable local government as well. And then, I, I mean, the sort of searches we do and we the other project, unfortunately, is, I say unfortunately because we're in Brighton. We've got one in Wales and one in Glasgow at the moment, and it's it's trying to work out what's going on locally because a lot of people will say things are happening great and you look into it and it's the idea is happening and so it's all right we want people who really can do x y and z so but what one other thing that's interesting is some of them the um is a in my book i write about as a chapter on urban mining and i list people who are doing it and some of those people are Dutch companies are now over in they're in London. So there's a company called the Excess Materials Exchange, mm -hmm. who 
yeah, Christian Bemar and I was just I was just looking up who we is. It's them, yeah. Yeah. So they're somehow here. They've been working with the London Borough of Enfield on their Meridian Water site, and they did. They provide a digital platform. So if you can feed them the detail of the material that you've got, they will advertise it. But I, I, we're, we're trying. I'm trying to get my head around what they can really do right now, mm. rather than what they'd like to do next year or whatever. So I think in the UK, we're at the point where there's a lot of informal stuff going on. I know, and by that, I mean, you know, some wealthy clients, building owners who've got portfolio buildings who know they've got one empty, which can be used as a temporary store while they deconstruct that. There's a lot of that sort of stuff going on. That's only happening because we don't have the digital and physical resources elsewhere, because otherwise they wouldn't need to do that. So you could be one of those clients that set up your own in effect remanufacturing but that what would be interesting there is to get involved in terms of the academic r d that needs to be done with it because if you really did it i mean it might, might be just storing windows or stuff initially but you know if it really became a thing because you're dealing with furniture and other mm -hmm. stuff it would be great to sort of map that and see how it would grow yeah. because then you start everybody yeah there's the low line fruit of stuff that you you're going to the, the more it's more easy to reuse but then there's the difficult stuff and there are there's examples all around europe of the difficult stuff being reprocessed and reused even examples in this country but it's understanding how to make that work for for you yeah definitely. i think that's how we our experience of it as well is there's a lot of interesting and new organizations that are working to reuse materials but yeah. it's, it's a lot of different routes for different items yeah well i so think you can say some one company will take old windows it's very much like ad hoc and yeah um well a lot of these platforms yeah. are just setting up because they've got a bunch of stuff and then they sort of almost wither because they're not getting enough other stuff and they also there isn't a, a market for it but um yeah i mean it's it's uh, watch this space i mean it's just changing all the time I, like i said I, I had a bunch of structural engineers oh, from london um yesterday and they were talking about deconstructing a massive building in piccadilly to create another building in piccadilly so they were you know that's that and then when it starts becoming something that's done at scale then people will believe in it and invest in it did someone else try and say something in sorry i think kadra's got a hand up um first i just want to say a brilliant um presentation i really enjoyed um thank learning. you it's not an area that i normally um sort of are informed about but I guess um, what I wanted to know, are there any initiatives or maybe like funding opportunities that are currently available for like the council or social housing providers to um, to actively participate in this transition, circular economy? Um, off the top of my head, I can't I can't name you anything, but the, what I'm thinking about immediately is that the um, the group of local authorities who we did the retrofit route map with they are wanting to do um a sort of conference for local authorities on what they've learned and they're they're i mean they know more about it than me so i i think it might be quite good if i put you in touch with them because we were trying to do a conference in westminster um and it was going to be in june of course the general election was yeah. cool so everything everyone went into perda etc so it didn't happen so it is gonna that's gonna happen no no this is separate so this is um the um bright uh greater brighton economic partnership retrofit route map that we did which was seven local authorities which was actually led by the local authority where i live which is lewis and eastbourne it happened to be that the deputy chief executive of that local authority was the housing expert and he's not in housing now but he's like why don't we do this and that's why it happened it was a massive study i mean it was like I know 500,000 pounds worth of study because it was there were about 14 different partners and I I what my role was just to sort of design it this is what in my ideal world if it was a retrofit study what would it what would it include this this and then then I couldn't believe it. they came back and said oh, well here we go and they got the best people involved to do it so that was great which included um Clara Begnall George and her consultancy and she was that she invented Letty so mm -hmm. she was the person behind Letty. What's that collective called? What's, what's that? What, Letty? Uh, no, the, the conference, what's that all been called? Well, it, it, um, I can send you the word that we did, but the findings from that study haven't been officially oh, okay. published yet. Yeah. 
And what they want to do is do this conference to publish it. So we actually had a meeting last week and I know that they're still, they're still going to want to redo this. But what I might do is just put you directly in touch with um, the two people who were leading that project, um, because I know that they have just got some funding, but I can't remember what it was called, but literally because they <laughs> told me it last week and I went off on another call, but they've got this funding to do some retrofit on some of this, that, 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 some of the housing. But what they were looking at was ways in which uh, all sorts of creative ways to raise and borrow money mm. to create a housing stock which didn't rely so much on fossil fuels at the end of the day because you know we're yeah it's they're, they're dictating uh, our lives at the moment so how do we how do we disengage from the our addiction to fossil fuels and that, mm. and so um, that's the big question but the, what they like I said what they at the time what they were hoping to do was to go to central government and say with our maintenance budget, we can get this far. Um, if we wanted to do more, we'll need this money and we'll spend it on this. And they thought that quite rightly, I think that the relevant minister would think, well, you know what you're doing. OK, we will give you the money to do that. And other local authorities could could copy that model. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, that okay. would be helpful as well. To yeah, well, yeah. If you sent me a note. I'll... Sounds good. I've got a question. What role can emerging technologies like AI bring it in or can play in creating a more efficient circular construction? Yeah, system? well, I, that's a really good question. I mean, we need we've got the ability to uh, gather the data now. So whether that's the, the real performance of buildings with humans getting in the way and making it not perform how the old models might have said. So we can really predict how buildings perform when they're occupied. We can measure really accurately the components of our building stock like yeah that's been constructed for the last 400 years but more especially anything from the 20th century and the 21st century so once we can do that and we can uh, we can do the sort of life cycle analysis on that building stock that with better and better data by the way at the moment we're hindered the uh, I happen to know the people at RICS, which is the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, who produce the embodied carbon data on all the different components of what makes a building. Mm -hmm. uh, that data is slightly flawed and getting better and better and better. At the moment, it's good for like comparative studies. But if you really want to know the embodied carbon footprint of a building, it's an open debate. And that's why Marks and Spencer's in Oxford Street can be demolished in the name of low, low carbon. So that's why the net zero carbon building standard is really important. So we, mm -hmm. we all all talking about the same stuff. But we've got the capacity with computers and AI mm. to model what good looks like and mm. to agree what good looks like. And then to, you know, if, you, if you've got a sort of portfolio of uh, different building types and social housing, mm. affordable housing as well, um, then you can really see how it performs now mm. and how if you tweak it, it will perform that much better and where to do the tweaks. The and yeah. 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 But we, we, I mean, you know, we can do that anyway. I mean, any project that I do in my practice, we tend to work on existing buildings, existing situations. And the first thing we do is do a detailed digital measured survey of the building, understand what it's made of, but also we can predict, we can model how it really performs. Uh, IEM is something called IES model. And we do that on all our projects. And then through the model, we can do different, run different scenarios, which are, if you add, this insulation or this shading device or use the building in this way, it will perform differently. And then you know where, to, when you're on a limited budget, where to put the insulation, where not to put the insulation. Just that, is there similar technology use for, because I know Ruka and I've been looking into like climate adaptation and doing more predictive modeling on the effects of climate change in the yeah. future. Yeah. Is that something that you like? That's something that's in that? building regulations now. So it's sort of at, not accidentally, but it's got in there almost by stealth. So we've got we got the new part O, which is overheating. Now that that that's the overheating um, part of the building regulations, and with there you have to I can't remember the name of the model, but it, no, it's it's like IES modeling. So there you have to prove that your your building isn't going to overheat, and uh, the scenarios they run there can uh, include for now and for 30 years time or 10, 20, 30, 40 years time. So that's predicting uh, climate change. That's great. Yeah, so that's that, that's sort of there already. Yeah.
It's great. Yeah. Is it just overheating? It's that part. Oh, that's what it's about. Yeah. Yeah. So not like flooding. No, not yet. No, we're flooding. You just have to look outside. <laughs> but that, that's a really. I mean, just for flooding. We we had a building of ours that flooded last year. You know, a house that we designed for someone. It flooded because of the sort of weather we're having now. The clients are like came back to us, and their first response is, "You've designed a house that floods." And so we had this situation where we're well, building regulations. In fact, the building control officer on site had said, "Do X, Y, and Z in terms of soakaways," and 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 that all complies with building regs. And then the place floods, and the clients are like, "Well, what's wrong there?" And I said, "Well, it's got full building regs approval." Yeah, you know, it was. We were dictated to by these regulations. And that's where the regulations are out of step with what reality is. Because when you look on the environment agency's website about that particular site, by the way, no flooding. Still says no flooding. We know our client's house flooded three times and could flood again, but we had to do other work. And and that situation is very, and that's the situation where we are at the moment. We don't have the regulations that um, reflect where we really are in some instances. Mm -hmm. And obviously we know that about fire. That was the whole thing about the part B. So we, we don't have anything to do with flood flooding in the building regulations. We I mean, we, we just have to, uh, you know, our due diligence checks. We have to uh, see what the environment agency say for a site. But, you know, we know that London flash floods all the time. I mean, I do this thing every year. We'll have done for the last few years where I, I judge um, an architecture awards and it's always in July. We always have to go and see the buildings. And I often have to do the commercial buildings, the offices. And three years in a row, uh, some of the buildings have been flooded because yeah. they've been in King's Cross or, uh, you know, and it's three years in a row, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so we, we've got to sort of update the regulations universally, but also add to them, whether it's Part Z or part, another Part F for flooding or whatever, you know? Yeah. Okay. I'm just aware of timings. I think a couple people had to drop off. Um, so unless there's any other. Oh, I'm about to get my. I've got low battery. Yeah. Um, Send me an email. My my laptop's about to die. <laughs> yeah, and I'll I'll get the answers to the questions that were asked and send them all around in it. Okay. You know, like the funding and those kinds of. Things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, Duncan. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks oh, all. Bye. Thank you, Ryan. I was waving to a blank screen then. Thank you. <laughs>